All right, today I have a walk-in cooler that is down. So you can see here we're at 10 Celsius, 12 Celsius. Let's go do our general checks. Let's make sure our thermometers are reading correctly. So we got a third one up here. So those of that don't need Celsius, 53 Fahrenheit. That's warm. Both fans are running. And we have no ice buildup on the coil. All right. So we come here, you can see our distributor on our coil here is kind of iced up. And our coil is getting power, which means we have a call for cooling. And that liquid line is warm, which telling me the compressor is in fact pumping. Let's get this baby defrosted, hit fast forward. All right, so let's head out to the condensing unit, which is a little bit of a hike here. So again, we'll hit fast forward. And you want to make sure you defrost that coil because if we have ice on there, it's just going to show the sight glass is low, even though it might not be low. So we're here at the condensing unit. Doors locked. All right, got the door locked. Let's do our checks. First thing, compressor's running, condenser fan's running, and sight glass is flashing. So we most likely have a low charge, and you can see by our pressures here, 10 and 119, we are low on charge. So we're gonna go ahead, shut the unit off. And what that gonna do is it is going to equalize the system. So now I have 69 pounds of pressure for me to do a leak test on. So I only start my leak test at the usual suspects. So let's make it easy here. Let's go right to this evaporator coil. Start from the top on these U-bends. Let's see if we can locate this leak. It is freezing outside. So I'm hoping the leak is inside here. Uh, it's not going to be a fun day. It's, it's below zero Fahrenheit outside. It, it's really bad. It's windy. So let's hope the leak's in here. And let's see if we got nothing yet. Take our time. Be patient. Alright, I'm getting a hit somewhere here near this solenoid. Somewhere in this area. Let's check this TXV distributor. No leak at the distributor. Let's go to the back of the TXV. And we got a leak somewhere on the TXV here near the stem. All right, let's get this camera flipped around. Let's see if we can pinpoint the exact location of the leak. Make life nice and easy. So definitely a leak near the stem looks like. Let's move away from the stem not picking up any leaks. I'm going to turn the sensitivity down to the lowest setting here. We basically pinpointed the leak, but let's make it even easier for when we spray our bubbles on there. And yeah, we're leaking right at this stem right here. So we've pinpointed the leak. So now we're going to Go confirm it with uh, some soap bubbles here. All right, let's spray this up with our big blue here, big blue bubbles. And let's see if we can pinpoint where this leak is at. Uh, I always want to see the bubbles and I always actually take a picture of the bubbles. I always attach that to the work order. Uh, just just to be 100% sure the customer's not questioning. Not that they're going to, but uh, once they see a picture of the bubble, they know for sure it's leaking. So let's see if we can get a good shot here so we can attach to the work order. All right, you can see right there at 12 o'clock, we got a little bubble growing there. Definitely pinpointed the location of the leak. Here you can see it's probably yeah, 11, 30, 12 o'clock there. All right, so I'm just gonna do a quick sniff of the other side of the coil um, before we get this repair done. Let's make sure there's no other leaks in this coil. And once we're good there, uh, we're gonna go figure out what we're gonna do with this TXV. So let's just hit up all these U-bends. They love to leak. You can see the ones that are kind of greenish in color. Always question those. Look for any 
oil spots. I don't really see anything, but let's do our due diligence here and just take our time. Make sure there's not a secondary leak. We don't want to go through all this work and then it ends up needing a coil. So I'm confident here that there's only one leak and it's on the TXV. All right, so I cannot get a hot work permit, okay? So I'm going to have to rebuild this TXV. It's not how I like to do things, but I do not have a choice. As you can see, I just removed that sensing bulb. So we're going to start here by removing the power head. So first thing you want to do is make sure you have two wrenches on here. Um, if you twist this body, um, you're going to have issues with the TXV. So you got to make sure it doesn't twist. Uh, it doesn't take much force to twist this thing. All right, let's hit this fast forward really quickly again. Let's get this power head off and let's continue to dismantle this TXV. All right, next thing we want to crack off here is this stem on the back. There's a nut. Um, I find sometimes I don't have the best of luck with trying to crack this thing off. Okay, you don't want to put too much force. See how it's starting to twist a little bit? So what I'm going to do here is actually put the impact on. Uh, I always like to just try with the wrench, but let's get the impact. That'll make sure there's no twisting. Come off nice and easy. So now we have our stem off. We have our spring guide and our spring. So we're going to replace all of these parts, of course. And then now that all that's left is we're going to take off this uh, off the front here, this pin carrier. So let's go ahead and crack this guy off nice and easy using two wrenches. Once again, we do not want to twist the body of this. Just hit a quick fast forward here once again. And let's pull this guy right out. Um, obviously remember the sequence they go back in. Take your time. Um, it's not it's not very difficult to screw this up. So in this case, you know, I'm taking a video, so if I I know how to put everything back in that it's not backwards. Um But really the most important thing is the spring guide because you can put that on backwards. Everything else is pretty straightforward. So we're going to go ahead and we're just going to use a little bit of refrigerant oil. We're going to hit all the seals and we're going to hit up all the threads too. And let's just start reassembling in the reverse order of how we took it apart. And take your time here. Don't strip anything. Just remember to put your oil on and you'll be good. Nothing will leak. And super important, do not twist the body. Um, I have twisted one once before, so that's how I know that. Way back in the day, the first time I ever tried to do one of these. Didn't have that big wrench that you see me using. And I twisted it really badly and I had to unsweat it. So since that day, I've always replaced the TXV. I've never bothered rebuilding it. But in this case, hot work permit was not an option. Um, and we need this thing fixed ASAP, so we got a rebuilder. Alright, so now we're just going to come here, get the stem on, make sure we oil up those threads, get this thing on nice and tight, and we are going to hit fast forward again, and we're just going to Tighten it with our two wrenches one more time. Once again, I can't stress the importance of not twisting this valve body. So let's go ahead and hit the fast forward again. Let's get this thing on nice and tight. We're all good. Now all that's left is the power head. So I go ahead, oil up these threads. Very important to oil them up. Let's throw our power head on here. And let's go ahead and hit fast forward one more time.
And everything is good and tight. Let's go put all that's left now is put our sensing bulb on. And there's this tag. Make sure you put it. Okay, that's a Sporlin D. Okay, that's how you identify the valve body. Okay, that thing is super important. Because what's on the power head is actually not telling you what body's on there. So let's go ahead, do a leak test here. Let's be thorough. Let's make sure nothing is leaking. Uh, you don't want to go through all this and then you get called back a month later because the part that you put together is leaking because you didn't put enough oil or you didn't tighten any something not enough so this part is very important take your time make sure and so far so good I'm gonna go ahead and just take this cap off let's just be sure the new stems not leaking technically you could have that cap on and it's the, the uh, leak detectors not picking it up so just be thorough and we have no leaks that's great news all right let's just pull a quick vacuum here all right time to fire the unit charge her up and let's see if we can get her down to temp all right so i've been charging it sight glass is still flashing my bottle showing it's empty there's actually seven pounds left in my bottle still see here that nothing's moving I can't get the head pressure up we're at 88 um, saturation condenser saturation okay I want to be around 90 I'm around three pounds okay my bottle is frozen it is so cold outside today it's ridiculous so I'm gonna walk this bottle back inside let's run some hot water on it and let's get the last couple pounds into the system all right so we are back charged okay sight glass is full okay and look at our head pressure 89.9 so basically 90 condenser saturation temperature 90 see there we go we hit it so we are good with the charge here it's a really cold day so it's going to be really easy to add the winter charge and i've added about two and a half pounds so we're at five and a half pounds here that we've put in the system Alright, so let's just go over um, figuring out how we got our head pressure. So, um, I need at least 90 Fahrenheit uh, condenser saturation temperature. Okay, so that number is super important. If I'm below 90, it's telling me we're probably low on charge. Okay, so if we know we have a 30 condenser split, okay, that tells us that at 60 Fahrenheit this unit can run anything below 60 Fahrenheit we now need to use the headmaster control or the ORID okay and it'll kick in and the ORID or the headmaster control is going to make sure that we maintain a 90 Fahrenheit condenser saturation temperature okay so in this case we're at zero Fahrenheit if we add 30, if we add 30 Fahrenheit to that for a condenser split, okay, we're only at 30 Fahrenheit saturation. I need 90. So anytime we're below 60 Fahrenheit, our headmaster control has to kick in and it has to maintain 90 Fahrenheit. So if you look there, we're at 88 Fahrenheit, okay, sight glass was still flashing, okay, it took two two and a half more pounds to get to 90 Fahrenheit. Okay, now our sight glass was no longer flashing. So you might think two Fahrenheit isn't gonna matter. It matters tremendously, okay? In this case, we have a sight glass, so you're thinking, well, what does it matter? But this is super important for when you're troubleshooting if you have a bad headmaster control, okay? If we're below 90 Fahrenheit and everything in the system's working correctly, we have a full charge, Okay, we know the issue is probably with that headmaster control. So it's really important that you understand that two degree difference is a big, big factor. Okay, it was two and a half pounds. That's a big part of the charge. Okay, so it's, it's really important that you use this 90 Fahrenheit that we maintain this and you understand why we need to maintain it. So that if you ever have a headmaster issue, 
Uh, you'll know how to troubleshoot it, although there's more troubleshooting to do with probes and taking temperatures and whatnot. But this is just kind of gets you pointed in the correct direction. All right, so my superheat is around 15, so let's get that guy adjusted. I usually go four quarter turns is what I like to do. And you can see here, we're at eight or nine superheat. We're at 34 box. It's still calling for cooling. We probably have an issue there, but our superheat is set correctly. Okay, eight to 10, eight to 12. So we're right in where we want to be. This thing's gonna run efficiently. Let's check this temp controller, see where it's set at. It's set at 32, yikes, that's really low. So they put drinks in this cooler, mostly, so I'm gonna set it a little bit lower than usual. We'll do a 34 um, temperature uh, set point. All right, so unfortunately I could not get a hot work permit. That's why I chose to rebuild the TXV. Uh, generally, I like changing them out the entire thing, just unsweating and put a new one in. Uh, in this case, that was not an option. I had to get this box up and running. Uh, we didn't have a choice. Okay, and then just another thing, you want to make sure that you're going over all your checks. Uh, check everything at your coil before you go outside. Like, it was a hike to get to that condensing unit. Okay, you want to make sure everything's good inside. The thermostat's calling. Okay, the coil's free of ice. Okay, it's super important that the coil's free of ice because... If it's not, uh, you go check the sight glass, it, the sight glass is gonna be flashing, okay? And it doesn't mean you're low on charge. You could have a bad thermostat or something. So do all those checks first before you go outside and go to the condensing unit, okay? You wanna work smart, okay? Efficiently, quickly. You don't wanna be going back and forth, back and forth, especially that day was freezing. It was brutal working out there. The wind was so bad. It was just really bad. You saw the bottle froze on me. I still had like eight or nine pounds left in that bottle. I was like, there's no way it's empty. And I weighed the ball. I'm like, there's nine pounds in here still. It was literally frozen. I had to take it inside, run under the hot water for like five minutes. But they were all good. We got the charge going. And uh, everything's good. Boxes up and running. Customers happy.